Today's shows bore about and by seniors, giving information to enhance one's quality of life. And speaking of quality of life, our in-studio guest this morning is Dr. Jaspreet Parahar of City of Hope. And later in the hour, we will be speaking with Noel Aronson, who is one of our sponsors. Welcome, Doctor. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you so Good. much. It's a pleasure to be here. Welcome, welcome. Great to have you. And what are we going to talk about? Whatever, um, you know, um, you how think about, is... How about uh, the Dodgers? <laughs> <laughs> seventh we can certainly talk about that. <laughs> seventh game, game today. Seven tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. I was corrected. Well, so I'm not a baseball fan. Sorry. <laughs> what's baseball? I don't know. <laughs> Whatever's, whatever they do with that bat when they have the ball thrown at them. That's cricket. <laughs> That's right. Not in my book. <laughs> ah. But, you know, we're going to talk today medically because our seniors, you know, sometimes they're desperate for information. They, um, you know, have problems as you get older. And um, unfortunately, um, these problems arise up suddenly. <coughs> and, you know, they sometimes will even end up in the hospital. So what do you do in terms of at City of Hope? City of Hope, cancer specialists, surgeons, kidney specialists, I mean, they're, everybody's got their background. What is your background? So what I do is I'm a urologist and a urologic oncologist. So I deal with um, urinary systems starting from the kidneys, uh, the ureters, the bladder, prostate in men, urethra, genital organs. Mm -hmm. um, and also, um, not only the benign um, problems with them, but also the cancers. Mm -hmm. And to be uh, treating those cancers in minimally invasive fashion, using robotics, mm -hmm. using laparoscopy, um, you know, to, to um, that's what my specialty is and that's, uh, you know, what I focus on in my work. So one of the, those listeners who are males um, now, they, they worry about prostate cancer. And prostate cancer, uh, for many, um, is a dilemma because uh, the treatment has, for years, vacillated back and forth. Surgery, medication, surgery, medication. But you had mentioned robotics, and mm -hmm. robotics is exactly what it sounds like. It's robots. And now we can do better surgery, less side effects afterwards that allows our males to function. Absolutely. I think it has re revolutionized, um, you know, especially the pelvic operations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what took longer, b larger incisions, longer time to heal, you know, more recovery time. Mm -hmm. You know, patients can usually go home the next day or the following day. And, um, you know, the robot, what it allows us to do is get into small spaces such as the pelvis, perform complex operations, and um, have lower blood loss, have faster mm -hmm. recovery. And, you know, Essentially what it is, is it's not an automated surgery, so the surgeon is still in the control <coughs> of the operation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's essentially extension of my hands miniaturized into the, into the pelvis, into the body. Very good. I think the, some of our listeners are going, so you set everything up, you press a button, and the robot takes care of everything. And that's just not the way it goes. Exactly. And they, a lot of our um, listeners also don't know that uh, as one who has done surgery, I know getting into the pelvic area is very difficult. It's very, you know, those with big hands are going to have trouble <laughs> sinking their fingertips down into areas that, you know, are very delicate. And <coughs> when it came to prostate surgery, I think one of the big problems uh, and side effects uh, to it was incontinence and um, uh, sexual dysfunction. And uh, a lot of that, because we can now do the surgery uh, much better with better optics, it gets easier to eliminate those uh, complicating uh, problems. Absolutely. So, you know, prostate <coughs> cancer is not only removal of the cancer, but there's a lot of functional outcomes, mm -hmm. <coughs> as you mentioned, with the incontinence <coughs> and also rectal dysfunction that can happen. Mm -hmm. But to improve the outcomes and to minimize these sort of side effects, it's important that um, we do this complex operation, this delicate operation in, a, in, a, in, the, in the best um, fashion that we, then we can visualize uh, and, um, you know, achieve the best results. Right. I have a hard time picturing a tin man 
pulling <laughs> stuff out of my body, just <laughs> wandering around all over me and doing what he has to do. I, it, that just blows my mind. Well, that's why I quit surgery because I was called the Tin Man. You were called Tin Man. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't like that but I, uh, it, characterization. You know, it give, visualize it. <laughs> this little robot bouncing uh, around on your body uh, and, and getting his hand <laughs> and pulling this out and then shoving this here. I, I, it, it's absolutely beyond me. Absolutely beyond me. Not, not quite that. I, I don't see that picture because I've seen the robotics, but I, you know, I can see you. Barbara, where you're looking at it, and you're saying, uh, "Is that a, a bat or is that a cricket wicket?" No, it's a <laughs> it's a it's a Tin Man. Tin Man. Tin Man. Well, robots. What do you think of as robots? <laughs> well, and you know, this is it's not automatic. That's for sure. <coughs> yes. And it is set up so that the surgeon is in control. But like I say, the optics are great because yes. before you could not you could not visualize the some of the structures, Absolutely. you know, there, there was a nerve cutting across or a vessel cutting across or maybe a muscle sphincter cutting across. Sometimes you wouldn't be able to see that and snip, snip, you're done and you wouldn't know it. Right. So this is a tremendous. So the robot wouldn't make a mistake? No, no. It's the, the surgeon always controls the robot. So it's the So hands. he's got this little box here with these knobs controlling this. No, it's not like it's, it tells it's actually. <laughs> It's like flying, the, the flying model airplanes. It, the way we control it is we put these sensors on our fingertips, essentially. And the whatever movements we are doing outside, looking at a, um, a video console, which actually affords us 10 times magnification, um, that movement is carried out by the robot inside. It, it copies what the surgeon is doing, essentially. And that allows, again, miniaturization of the incisions. It allows complex surgeries in, in the spaces where, you know, it's difficult to uh, access. Um, and, um, you know, most people would agree that it's, a, it's essentially a better operation outcomes that patients are getting. Well, do you have to take a course on how to run these things? Absolutely. So I would hope so. <laughs> after, after medical school, which is uh, four years, um, you know, one has to do residency. Right. And in urology, um, I did two years of general surgery and then four years of urologic training. Um, so we had a lot of robotic experience during our residency uh, in, in surgery. In addition, I did a uh, robotics and minimally invasive um, uh, and urologic oncology fellowship dedicated to this type of um, treatment. Um, whether it's dealing with prostate cancer, kidney cancers, uh, bladder cancers, testicular cancers, those, you know. Uh, um, th um, and, you know, for the dedicated amount of year, two years, that's all you do, just these, taking care of these kind of patients and doing these complex operations. Um, so there, you know, I typically quote patients, you know, after high school, it's about 15 years of additional training. Mm -hmm to be able to do this for somebody that's, that's in, right. in a safe that's fashion, in an effective fashion. And, um, and you, you know. really have to want to do that, to go through that extra, extra training. Yes, and wow. the public demands it. Because we the technology is so good that we're moving ahead quickly. And when we have a technology that makes it safer for our patients uh, and the outcomes are better, you know, no doubt it's, you know, the society will demand that people be trained and doctors be trained uh, to continue and move forward uh, with this technology to help uh, our patients and our loved ones. So uh, it's, to me, you know, it extends beyond that because we're using robotics and general surgery now and brain surgery as well. So, you know, these are all places where it's going to extend to. I don't think it's going to extend where we're going to just have a robot doing it by itself. It's always going to be controlled by a, a physician, Barbara. So I'm not right. too afraid that... You um, cannot take away the expertise <coughs> in the anatomy and the pathology and the surgical mm -hmm. dissection planes. Mm -hmm. you know, but this what is happens, not something that can be automated. What happens if something happens in, with the robot? So what if it times, malfunctions? At all mm -hmm. times, the surgeon's under control. There's additional surgeon or a um, first assist at the bedside as well. And, of course, both of these, ev everybody's in the same room. Mm -hmm. At any time there's a problem with the robot, you can always back off, you can always fix the issue, or you can always make a large incision and do the operation in a traditional way. 
-huh. So the safety factor is certainly there. Uh, there's a lot of redundancies uh, in these systems. Um, and um, to have an actual technical malfunction is, is quite rare. Mm. Wow. I, st I still wouldn't want it happen to me. <laughs> but you know something? I have to be out cold if somebody, if, and I wouldn't want to know if a robot was going to operate on me. Yeah, and usually you are out cold, and, but you will yes. be told that, uh, that it is going to be a robot. But I think we were talking before uh, one, of our la mm. one of our shows before, uh, last week or the week before, about um, a surgeon who was in Japan, mm -hmm. and the uh, patient was in, at Hopkins, right. and the surgeon in Japan was actually in control of the robot Mm -hmm. in at Hopkins yep. and so that could happen or you might have wow. certain experts around the world Absolutely. that will be able to operate on our patients especially I can see that in neurology you know that there's some delicate issues related to what they're doing and right. recognition and the techniques that one has to be able to to do are just something that you know has to be slowly taught and you know people will be able to do that but there will still be people at right there hovering and at bedside uh, and watching how the robot is is working and you know sometimes these can be broadcast around the world oh, too so, so everybody it, learns and it's a continuous learning process mm -hmm. you know it's not like once you finish training and that's it and you know there's a lot of uh, annual training seminars, CMEs, mm -hmm. board certifications, uh, recertifications. All these things are, you know, meant to keep the skills uh, up to date and, um, you know, every everything uh, standard of care. And it's 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 interesting you mentioned with the um, remote surgeries. The robot was initially uh, developed by the military to be able to do these combat. in a remote fashion in a combat situation. Mm -hmm. And then there was also uh, development in doing this in their space, you know, and, and with NASA and remotely, if there's an issue um, that, you know, that can be treated remotely uh, using these robotic systems. Yeah, you know, one of my, unfortunately, one of my friends, his father was a surgeon. He was in Vietnam and he died. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you always see the MASH units, uh, you know, that was Korean War, but, uh, you know, the, one of my friends, his father was a well-known surgeon in Los Angeles and um, he was in Vietnam and he passed away. Uh, from a bombing. So, but, you know, we hope we're not in combat zones anymore. Right. You know, we hope that uh, there could be places like a volcano eruption or there's an earthquake or something where, you know, people can't get in and, you know, then our surgeons can be there. But it's a uh, super asset and, and technology has moved us forward. But let's, you know, that's prostate. How about with women? What, what cancers uh, that are urologic in nature do most of women that you see face? It depends on their risk factors, of course. Mm -hmm. um, things like smoking, uh, obesity, genetic uh, history, uh, family history of, um, you know, uh, different cancers. So one of the common things is kidney cancers. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, kidneys are responsible for filtration of blood and, um, ex you know, production of urine. But a lot of those metabolites, uh, including smoking, can build up and you know, um, can be responsible for um, causing genetic mutations, which can lead to cancers of the kidney. Mm -hmm. And um, for kidneys, you know, we can, uh, depending on the size and location of these tumors, we are offering <coughs> partial nephrectomies. Mm -hmm. um, so just removing the cancer cells, leaving the healthy kidney behind. Sometimes the cancer is very large and, um, you know, the entire kidney has to be removed. Um, that's one thing, and there's uh, urothelial cancers, which is mm -hmm. involving the lining of the urinary system. Mm -hmm. uh, so that could be uh, from the kidneys down to the bladder. Mm -hmm. Bladder cancer is also common. Mm -hmm. uh, again, smoking plays a large risk factor in this. Uh, patients, you know, typically present with uh, irritative voiding symptom symptoms, a lot of frequency, urgency, mm -hmm. and uh, blood and urine. So any hematuria or blood and urine should never be ignored. Right. Male or female, and it should mm -hmm. be worked up and to make sure that there's nothing going on. <coughs> and some people think that you, when you get a cancer, you're gonna, you know, feel lousy and you're gonna have, you're gonna have uh, pain, and that does not always happen. And you were mentioning hematuria, which is blood in the urine. 
I mean, one of the first signs is, is that, and some of the symptoms could emulate a bladder infection. And you think, oh, I just got a bladder infection, that's fine. But, you know, you if you're older and you have these risk factors that you mentioned, you know, especially smoking, then you better think about the possibility of seeing your doctor when you are having hematuria or blood in your urine because, you know, that's a sign, and Absolutely. that's an early sign, and that could be a sign that, you know, people miss that, you know, it can go on for a while. And really... Kidney cancers, I can't, you know, the ones that have been treated for 10, 20 years now and cured mm -hmm. have been kidney cancers. And, um, you know, just jump on that because I've seen those that are just going too late and they've gone so far that I metastasized that we can't do anything about it. So, you know, make sure that uh, if you're a senior listening right now, you've got the risk factors, you know, you know, heavily think about the possibility of visiting your primary care doctor to make sure that, um, everything is okay and that uh, it's not a simple thing, but it might be more complicated than you think. Absolutely. So when we going back to guys, though, guys have not only the prostate problems, but they yep. have the kidney problems and they have the um, uh, bladder problems as well. Absolutely. Um, and sometimes there uh, uh, can be problems related to um, secondary cancers that are affecting then the kidneys, and the kidneys become a problem. Uh, and there can be spread to that area and stop urination and things like that. So, you know, understanding all the the possible uh, symptoms that one might get, you know, you, you have to be alert. And as you're getting older, you really have to stay on this because if you don't, uh, being too late at this could be uh, a negative outcome for you. Absolutely. And the other uh, important point is to get a p annual or semi or <clears throat> every other year uh, PSA <coughs> testing. Mm -hmm. It's a simple blood test. It's looking for um, prostate cancer tumor marker. It's called mm -hmm. prostate specific antigen PSA. Mm -hmm. That blood test in combination with the rectal exam is very mm -hmm. important for men um, because it can detect early signs of prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. Prostate cancer um, doesn't always produce symptoms, so a lot of people may not realize it until it's spread that uh, they could, there's something going on. So this is one of the screening um, subjects that is important. Yeah, and, you know, I hate to say this, for the last 10 years, PSA has been bantied about, you know, um, like a, a badminton, or what is it? Oh, birdie. Yeah. Uh, because, it, you know, you know, Get the PSA, don't get the PSA. When do you get the PSA? If it's rising uh, at a higher rate, uh, then, you know, you have to do something. I mean, you, you, just, you just, there have just been so many unfortunate um, uh, stories about people who neglected at some point to do their PSA because they've been told not to, that they get themselves into trouble also. So uh, when the prostate starts to get enlarged um, and you know, sometimes it's enlarged and there's no cancer, but when it either with cancer or no cancer, there get to be, the, there are symptoms, especially for guys, isn't, right. isn't there? Right, absolutely. <clears throat> so the, the controversy with PSA is that are we screening too many people and are we treating too much prostate cancer, which otherwise would not have caused a problem in, in, in that person's life? Um, I, in my opinion, I think we shouldn't silence the alarm. Instead, we should mm -hmm. be thinking about how to respond to the alarm better. Mm. In there other words, if the PSA good. is there uh, elevated, then maybe we should perform some additional testing to risk stratify that patient to see what other comorbidities are present, you know, hypertension, diabetes, coronary heart, um, heart disease. Um, you know, these are competing comorbidities uh, in elderly um, and uh, also, not all prostate cancer has to be treated aggressively. Um, there's a whole field of active surveillance that we're, you know, mm -hmm. uh, referring patients for, and uh, where we can monitor, you know, low volume, low grade, less aggressive cancers for many, many years. And um, you know, that's a, that's an excellent option uh, for you know patients who have um, other medical issues going on as well. Um, as you mentioned, you know, as men um, age, typically greater than 50 years, they start feeling some urinary symptoms. Mm -hmm. And that's usually due to enlargement of the prostate. Um, prostate enlarges with age, with testosterone. Um, and the, the way I describe it to the patients is, imagine a um, straw going through an orange. 
And essentially what's happening is that orange is growing inside and I- impinging that urethra, that urine, urine tube. Mm-hmm. So it it's becomes harder and harder for patients to urinate. You know, they have to wait. They have to uh, push and strain. They have to go often. They have to wake up multiple times at night. Um, and, um, you know, this could be dangerous for patients who are elderly, mm-hmm. who are on multiple medications, to be getting up multiple times a night. You know, there's risk of falls, you know, especially at night. So all these things, you know, if these are becoming a bother, uh, bother <coughs> for the symptom, then they should be seen by their medical doctor or, you know, see your urologist who can uh, help address these um, symptoms. So, Dr. Parahar, you're here. City of Hope is now here in Santa Clarita. You're at 23823 Valencia Boulevard, suite number 25250, which is right next to my office in Santa Clarita, right across from the from City Hall. Uh, is there a phone number that we can get uh, in yeah. case? 661-799-1990. Dr. Perihar, great information for our seniors. Thanks for being on the show today. Uh, you're welcome to come back because there's so many other interesting things that we could talk about relative to our urologic problems in our seniors. We're going to take a break right now on your hometown station, AM 1220, KHTS. Thank you very much. <laughs> Naughty boy. The best live theater can be found right here in the Santa Clarita Valley. The Canyon Theater Guild has been entertaining audiences for decades with top quality musicals and plays. Located in Old Town Newhall, the CTG also offers workshops for the young actor in your family. For more information, call the box office at 799-2702 or go to canyontheater.org. Who says nothing good happens after midnight? Denny's is best known for their breakfast served round the clock like the Grand Slam. But you can enjoy breakfast, lunch, or dinner in a casual atmosphere 24-7. At Denny's, the lunch and dinner menu has a variety of appetizers, craveable burgers, salads, and entrees, along with the best desserts in town. Wherever you live in Santa Clarita, there's a Denny's close by. If you're pulling an all-nighter or don't feel like cooking, get into Denny's today. Good stuff is happening at Denny's. Drugs or alcohol abuse can tear a family apart. In Santa Clarita, just like everywhere else, it's an epidemic. The Way Out Recovery is here to help. Call them now at 296-4444 or visit them on the web at thewayoutrecoveryscv.com. The Way Out offers outpatient treatment for adolescents, adults, and family members. The Way Out is compassionate, caring, professional, and confidential. You and your family don't have to suffer any longer. Call The Way Out Recovery now, 296-4444, or visit thewayoutrecoveryscv.com and make an appointment. Asking for help is the first step. At Advanced Audiology, we know how important hearing is to you, your loved ones, your work success, your safety, and your ability to stay in the game. Most people won't admit hearing loss to themselves or others. We make it easy for you. Today's digital hearing aids come in a variety of styles, including invisible. All feature-rich, providing unparalleled hearing quality, wearing comfort, and automation that simplifies your life. Don't be fooled by our imitators. There's only one advanced audiology with the purple sign next to AAA on Valencia Boulevard. Hometown. Your hometown station. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me? Barbara Cochran with my co-host, Dr. Jean Dorio, on your hometown station, KHTS. And we're speaking now with Nola Aronson of Advanced Audiology, who also happens to be one of the sponsors of the Senior Hour. Welcome back again. It's good to see you. Yeah, always good to see you, Barbara. <coughs> and and thanks Dr. for being Dorio. our sponsor and putting up with us. <laughs> 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 well, not, as long as not she, too hard to do. Well, as long as she can come on once or twice a month yeah. and, you know, tell us what for. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, let, you know let, <laughs> let's talk about something that I think is important relative to hearing because, you know, we've talked about this in the past that there are some, some of our senior patients who are diagnosed or deemed having dementia. And they have demen- they don't have dementia, they just have a hard time hearing. But because they 
are not interacting, saying things appropriately in responses to maybe question or discussion, they get, get into trouble and they get a false diagnosis. <coughs> How mm -hmm. often do you see that? Well, um, you know, it's um, like the old days when kids were being diagnosed as mentally retarded, mm -hmm, and they really go. weren't mentally retarded. I mean, when um, somebody comes in, they've just had a stroke or something like that, um, a lot of times it's hard to tell whether it's hearing versus cognition. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And so um, it's very important to get a hearing test so we know how much of it is hearing. And then, you know, expectations of what happens when the person's wearing a hearing aid is, is a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm. Because um, is it the hearing aid that's not working or is the person not able to process the sounds? Right. Totally so, different problems. Right. Totally different. I right. have a patient in the hospital <clears throat> who came in very sick, uh, wasn't responsive. Uh, we did all the things we needed to do to get him better, and he started to respond. But um, I noticed that, you know, he just didn't seem like he was – responding um, to questions like he did in the past. But then I did notice that, you know, as I got closer, he was able to hear me better. So I just got the uh, scope and I looked in his ears and he had earwax. Oh, so, yeah. um, you know, that, you know, eliminated the possibility that uh, he had a stroke. But, you know, everybody was thinking, he had a stroke, he had a stroke, and uh, just had to put some earwax remover in, and, and we got rid of the problem. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. Uh, and oh. it's easy. It's easy diagnosis as opposed to <clears throat> doing big-time MRIs and brain studies and blah, 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 blah. Right. Well, the other thing is that's um, why we want to get people early and give them a free baseline hearing screening just so people know where they're at. It is so important. You know, all of us, we get our eyes checked, we get our teeth checked, we go and we get a physical, and even many times the doctors don't ask about hearing or, mm -hmm. or things like that. Mm -hmm. And so hearing gets put on a back burner when it's the third largest um, disease after... Um, I think it's cancer and heart heart problems. Mm -hmm. Hearing comes in third. Hearing but well. it gets ignored all the time. And um, so a lot of people are afraid to come into our office because they think all we want to do is sell hearing aids. Mm -hmm. We're not a hearing aid sales place. If a hearing aid is a solution to a problem, then we will talk about it. But like you said, a lot of people come in and they have wax in their ears. Mm -hmm. Or they have fluid behind their <coughs> eardrum and they didn't even know it. But mm -hmm. they'd rather just like not pay attention to it because they're so afraid of hearing it, which I really don't understand that. I understand it, you know, many years ago. Um, in fact, uh, tomorrow I'm celebrating my 30th anniversary in Santa Clarita. Wow. Just, just like the city of Santa Clarita, 30 That's right. years as we well. We both start at the same time. Well, they're, they're in December, but... Um, I mm -hmm. started now, and uh, tomorrow is the big day. And um, why I brought that up is because, you know, hearing aids used to be horrible. They used to be big. They used to not help mm -hmm. you <clears throat> understand. So I understand. And it was for, quote, old people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's but, true. But mm -hmm. now we have the baby boomer generation. We mm -hmm. have, you know, it has nothing to do with age, really. Hearing loss has nothing to do with nothing. age at all. I just put on my um, advanced audiology Facebook page a beautiful video of all these young people getting cochlear implants mm. and hearing for the first time in their lives and watching their faces and smiling. It just, it's just something incredible. How could you do without hearing? Um, so I get people coming into me all the time with that same problem. You know, well, they're so expensive, and I can't spend that kind of money on myself. And, um, you know, you know, I'd rather just not hear, or I can make do. I don't really have a hearing problem. It's everybody else that mumbles. But if you, like you brought up in the beginning, if you do not stimulate the brain, the brain is what hears. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
That's you right. start missing out on things, you are going to look like you have dementia and Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. It's not going to necessarily cause it. I mean, if you're going to get it anyway, but they, the studies for over the last two years have shown that they are related. And hearing is also related to heart problems. It's related to diabetes. It's related to a lot of other ailments, not just I can't hear or I hear okay. So remember I told you at the beginning of the year, last year we did a thousand free hearing screenings mm -hmm. at our office mm -hmm. and we ended up with a thousand twenty two. Oh you did? Yeah. A thousand twenty two. So our goal this year has been fifteen hundred. Mm -hmm. Um we're at a thousand and it's November first. Mm -hmm. So got come on months. everybody, you gotta come help us make our goal so that we know that we're helping our community with their hearing. And uh, you don't necessarily have to think you have a hearing problem. Just come on in and we'll tell you you don't have a hearing problem. But the other part of that, Nola, is it's not just for checking one's hearing. It's to set up a baseline hearing screen so we know where your hearing is at. And mm -hmm. it's just like getting your cholesterol or your red blood cell count. You know where it is so that later down the line, if something is going on, you're not sure what's happening, your doctor is not sure, yeah, you get another blood test. If it's lower, then you can start focusing on the problem. But a baseline hearing test will help an individual understand that if something is going on later down the line, we can make that comparison and be able to use right. that to even sometimes make a diagnosis. Uh, and and help them so and it's proof that you know maybe it will show that they do need uh, a hearing test or it could rule it out and say no you don't need a hearing hearing uh, aid at all you can you'll be just fine right but getting the baseline is key and important and medicare pays for that don't they a baseline yes so you know if you're a senior you know you should be getting your uh hearing checked just to make sure because you keep all the records you know, if something happens, and I think you had a story in the past, Nola, about somebody who had a baseline hearing test, and it really became relevant after they were in a car accident. That's right. And they had head trauma, mm -hmm. and it, they realized that there was some audiology type of problem, uh, but it was it came out once you repeated the test and you showed that it was different from baseline. Right, exactly. And then she was able to use that for the insurance company. Mm -hmm. And then I told you another story where a friend of mine came in. She knew something was wrong, but she didn't know what was wrong. She was having trouble hearing out of one ear. I told her, come in and get your baseline. And it turned out that she had an acoustic tumor. Mm -hmm. And I got it. I got uh, Now, what is an acoustic tumor? So it's a tumor that's usually benign, but it's on the um, acoustic nerve which is in your oh. uh, brainstem. Interesting. Well, you can learn something new every day, don't yeah. you? Yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. That's oh, good. Yes, mm -hmm. that's exciting. An acoustic tumor. I've never heard of that. But anyway, next week, Barbara, I'm going to test you on it. <laughs> <laughs> ABC. It, it turned out to be benign. You know, most of them are benign. But if it didn't, it could have gone into other areas mm -hmm. and um, affected other things. Mm -hmm. But I was able to... Get her to the doctor fast enough. I scared her. And she got to the doctor fast enough, and she um, was very happy and saved. <laughs> so um, she's doing very well now. I just happened to see her a couple of weeks ago just in, you know, uh, through the chamber. Um, so it, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. And all we want to do is educate people about hearing because hearing, like I said, is left out all the time. And our goal is to educate as many people as possible, including, you know, the physicians that we go around and talk to, um, just so they keep up on the latest. Mm -hmm. Right, Dr. Doria? Correct, correct. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's important, I think, for physicians and family members and caregivers to understand that. And coming up here on your 30th anniversary, though, you've seen a lot of changes in hearing aids. And, you know, of course, the size has diminished, but technology has changed it tremendously where you can, can, if you have two hearing aids, you can control one side more than the other side. 
Uh, you can have it linked into your cell phone. You can have it uh, come in through your television. I mean, there's okay. so many things that are different now from 30 years ago. Uh -huh. what, is, what do you think is, other than the size of the um, hearing aid, what do you think is the biggest thing that you have seen in 30 years, um, the uh, biggest advancement that has helped uh, your patients uh, and changed their quality of life? Being able to understand speech in noisy environments. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's where CRISPR most people now. have the, the, the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. But the background noise before in the past, remember, people wouldn't, they didn't like hearing aids, remember? Right. Mm -hmm. But now the background noise has been filtered in a different way by technology, hasn't it? Right. The background noise doesn't go away. So if you have normal hearing, you're going to hear the noise, mm -hmm. okay? And, um, but when you have had a hearing aid in the past, the noise would overpower the speech. Right. But now with the new technology, you can actually understand speech in noise. It doesn't necessarily take away noise. That's a misconception that people have. Like, how much noise is this going to reduce? It's mm -hmm. not going to reduce the noise. It's going to enhance the speech. Mm -hmm. And the speech is much more clear and more natural sounding. I put a hearing aid on an experienced user yesterday, and I could see the tears welling up in her eyes. And she said, wait a minute, you're just talking to me. You're not in my hearing aids. And I had my back to her on purpose. And I said, are you hearing me? And she goes, yes, but it doesn't sound like you're talking in my hearing aids. Mm -hmm. And I said, because everything's so natural that it's not sounding amplified anymore. Mm -hmm. And so she walked away and she <clears throat> walked far away and she walked to the door and she put her back to me and I continued to talk really wow. softly. And I said, so, you know, is there a snake in the grass? Because S's are hard to hear in most people's hearing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So she goes, well, I hope not. <laughs> and and so I said, heard see, you said. so heard you yes. heard me with yes. your back. Instead of Far being away. naked, instead of being naked, it was snake. Yeah. <laughs> Are you naked in the grass? No, I'm not naked in the grass. But put that S on, they she heard the S. Right. And I say, do you want some sauce with your spaghetti? Oh yeah. And so she goes, well, it depends on what kind of sauce, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it was. She was like, couldn't believe it. And that's how the technology has really changed. It's so much more natural. It doesn't sound amplified. You're not mm -hmm. picking up every little distortion and every little thing. And my golfers, oh, my golfers, they mm. love the new technology. Is because it, they are, they're, they're now up to par? Yeah. <laughs> You're getting like Stephen. <laughs> my Stephen husband, or husband. My husband makes, um, <laughs> makes those kind of jokes all the time. <laughs> He's well, a, Robin wouldn't laugh at that. <laughs> the <laughs> other, the other thing that I wanted to talk a little bit more about is, are the young people, very young, mm -hmm. who exhibit problems, and many times it is a lack of hearing. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that more recently it's become known now that okay, let's check the hearing. Mm -hmm. right. I think it's become more prominent. Mm -hmm. When they have, when you have a, a young child who is acting out, or you know whatever the problem is, and sometimes it is a lack of hearing. Right. And I think I think that's become more pronounced now. Right. Uh, that, understood. That, and understood realized that that and yeah that that could be a problem. I can't right. tell the you hearing. how many of my seniors <laughs> will clap their hands when they're around their grandkids. This <laughs> that makes. Don't, haven't you seen? I see oh, it all yes. the time now. Yes. You know, because they're, they're so wise uh, checking to see whether their grandkids have a hearing problem. Almost always they don't. Mm -hmm. But I see them clapping their hands uh, to say, oh, yeah, they can hear shucks. That's not the problem. Well, a lot of times, you know, children get fluid behind their eardrums. Mm -hmm. And that causes 30% uh, hearing loss a lot of times, which makes you feel like you're hearing underneath water. And although it is medically treatable, if it stays in there a long time, especially before the age of two, um, they're not hearing the sounds correctly, so then they end up having a speech impediment. Mm -hmm. And it's also been shown by the time um, seven and eight come around, they have learning problems. And a lot of these learning problems are um, from the central auditory system. And what the kids are being diagnosed like now because they can't sit still, they don't pay attention, and all those things you were saying – 
it's, you know, not only just, um, it could be from the fluid being in the past, mm -hmm. and it could also be from having fluid now, causing enough of a hearing loss to, where they're not getting everything that's being right. said. Then they're being diagnosed with this thing called ADHD, which really is overdiagnosed and doesn't really exist, in my opinion. It's just a term, and then they medicate our kids. They're medicating kids at six months old uh, with, um, I forget what that stuff Ritalin. is called. <clears throat> yeah, Ritalin. Ritalin and, I mean, it's so ridiculous. A child will never have a chance if they get medicated at that age. And I'll probably get in trouble and have a lot of controversy. Maybe I'll. No, 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 no. but I, I think agree that, that, with you. That I agree too. So, yeah. you know, yeah. if there's controversy, we're all involved in that controversy. I'm, yeah. I'm fine with that. And <laughs> I'm very strong on that because I think our kids are over medicated when they have behavior problems because maybe they're too smart. Maybe, or maybe the teacher is going too fast. And, but we have a curriculum in the public schools and we have a lot of kids. And if you mm -hmm. go past the person's uh, learning, mm -hmm. then, um, you know, when they don't know A and they're already on C, mm -hmm. they're going to look like they have a, a behavior problem because mm -hmm. they don't understand. Always and we happen. don't have time to um, have small enough classrooms, mm -hmm. and we have to reach a certain goal by the end of the year, but... The children are not individualized anymore. No, not at all. And, that's and so, so sometimes let's take that's, care of them and just give uh -huh. them this medication, call them ADHD, and then we'll quiet them down. <laughs> you know what's interesting? Speaking of that, <clears throat> my son, who is now deceased, he had he was diagnosed with ADHD, but they didn't call it that. Yeah. This was... Learning disability. Oh, yeah, this was 40 years ago, right. 45 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, they put him on Ritalin. And I started doing a lot of research and come to find out that the, what they eat has a great deal right. to do with how they act. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, exactly. take kids off sugar. Right. Sugar is one of the worst things you can give a child who is hyperactive. Right. You know, and that's what I found out. So I started, I completely changed mm -hmm. our eating habits. And it was amazing how much he improved. Right. And plus, then he, then he, as he got older, he began, we used to tell him now, this, this is one or two of your problems. Right. And we want you to understand that, yes, this is your situation right now so that you can learn to adapt and change and it worked out and we took him off the Ritalin finally which was much better for him mm -hmm. you know yeah. oh yeah so that's true very interesting and we need to take a break don't we oh my goodness I'm Barbara Cochran with my co-host Dr. Jean Dorio on your hometown station KHTS if you're tired of your nail polish chipping a day or two after an expensive manicure, then you'll love the Gel Nail Polish Manicure now offered by Anne. Anne is a licensed manicure serving the Santa Clarita Valley in Canyon Country for over 15 years. And now she's offering the gel manicure that lasts without chipping for up to two weeks. Log on to hometownstation.com for details on how to get an amazing deal on gel nails by Anne on Restaurant Row. Or call Anne at 250-8340. Coming soon to the Canyon Santa Clarita, Jen Blossoms, Eddie Money, Chris Christofferson, Timothy B. Schmidt, Petula Clark, Tower of Power, Berlin, Todd Rundgren, Jefferson Starship, John Hyatt, The Spinners, Doc Inn, Lynch Mod, English Beat, Sinbad, Cinderella's Tom Kiefer, Ricky Lee Jones, Ambrosia, Donovan Frankenrider, Boogie Nights, and many more. Soulful Sunday brunch every Sunday, country nights on Wednesdays, and they're the perfect place to host your holiday parties and special events. The Canyon Santa Clarita, where music meets the soul. Tickets available through Ticketmaster. Let's go inside the mind of a 10-year-old. I should have worn earrings today. Buckle up, Sarah. Michaela's got, like, the best earrings. Sarah, buckle up. I wish my name was Michaela. We're not hitting the road until you buckle up, honey. Oh, yeah. Seatbelt. 
I wonder if there's pizza at school today. It can be tough getting through the kids, but it's your job to make sure they're wearing your seatbelts. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup for more information. At Advanced Audiology, we know how important hearing is to you, your loved ones, your work success, your safety, and your ability to stay in the game. Most people won't admit hearing loss to themselves or others. We make it easy for you. Today's digital hearing aids come in a variety of styles, including invisible. All feature-rich, providing unparalleled hearing quality, wearing comfort, and automation that simplifies your life. Don't be fooled by our imitators. There's only one Advanced Audiology with the purple sign next to AAA on Valencia Boulevard. Hometown. 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 I wanted to let you know that I really appreciate the way you guys do what you do. Your hometown station. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? Welcome back to the Senior Hour. I'm Barbara Carkin with my co-host, Dr. Jean Dorio, on your hometown station, KHTS, and we're speaking with Nola Aronson of Advanced Audiology. Yes, and we were just talking about your son and um, the diagnosis mm -hmm. of ADHD and how you um, changed his diet, which is really wonderful that mm -hmm. you were able to do that. Yes, well, I did a lot of research on it, mm -hmm. and it really worked. Right. Plus the fact that he was old enough at that point to understand the problem he had. Right. And mm -hmm. he was able to work on getting himself back onto a normal plane. And it right. really made a big difference. That's great. Wow. Yeah, yeah, well, really we good. have a problem with teenagers, too. And I think teenagers should get their hearing tested um, also <laughs> um, so that they can see, you know, when they're listening to those, I, um, I but, you know, wearing buds in your earbuds. ears. Earbuds, yeah. Couldn't think of the word. You know, and other people can hear the music. That's loud. Um, it's two, two cars loud. away. Yeah. No, that's just where the earbuds. Though, yeah, so. the earbuds. Um, in, yeah, their car, in their car too. Yeah, dum, you can. Dum, you can dum, think it's pull up to a car, and my car will literally shake mm -hmm. right. because the music and the bass is so loud. That's and right. My my son always said, oh. "Hey, mom, there's your next patient." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very but true. People don't realize um, at a young age how much noise affects their hearing and um shooting a gun is like the biggest thing mm -hmm. that causes hearing loss but you don't end up seeing it until you're about 50 years old most mm -hmm. of the time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you yeah, think yeah. that nothing's going to happen but you know we do make custom made musician earplugs for anybody that's um a musician or likes to listen to music. That's good. Um, so that it protects the ears, but you can still hear what people are saying. You can still hear the instruments. Wow. So, um, and those aren't very expensive. You know, I think they're about $230 a pair, mm -hmm. but they're custom made. And uh, so they fit the ear and they're not big. They're small. Even though all the musicians now, if you watch TV, you know, they're all wearing those mm -hmm. in the ear monitors. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. all like big and sticking out but nobody cares about that no nobody pays <laughs> attention to it because you know they're musicians and so it <laughs> just must be a headset so and for the regular folks who have to be around or they you know are allowed around lo loud things then you know they should be wearing something for protection yeah it depends on what loud things you're around but you're like, talking about those um custom made um earplugs i mean that's right you know, you should relabel those as like save the hearing and get them out there because I think a lot of people in my generation went to concerts and sat in the front with these huge speakers all over the place and now they can't hear. Mm -hmm. You know, some of my friends were in Vietnam in the military and they can't hear either. Right. And uh, some of my friends played in bands and they can't hear either. Right. And so there's a lot of exposure that you know, we have had in life that then hits you when you're 50 or 60 and you don't, you're not aware of it. Right. So right now, preventively, you know, saving your hearing with earplugs could be essential. Right. So that's good. So that's what we do. So what young people should come in and get a baseline too. Mm -hmm. I'd say when you're, you know, I'd say at any age, uh, but maybe when you're around 16 or so, come in and get a baseline. Mm -hmm. um, it's not age related. 
None of you know, hearing loss is definitely not age related. Although when people do get older, they tend to have more hearing loss because of this noise exposure and all this years of buildup of, mm-hmm. of your environment and things around you when you didn't protect yourself and, um, you know, and, and jobs that people have. Mm-hmm. And making sure that their jobs are following OSHA regulations and that the noise is being measured and, you know, all the things like that. So, um, you know, it's really exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, that there are so many things that we can actually do to help ourselves. Yeah. Uh, we help ourselves in all kinds of ways, mm-hmm. exercise, eating right. But let's don't forget about our ears. That's what That's I say. Right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, and you're celebrating your 30th anniversary here in Santa Clarita, and it's been, you know, just tremendous uh, for the city to have you Uh, Because you've been involved very actively in many organizations, and the list goes on and on and on in terms of your uh, financial contributions and your emotional support. So I think that, you know, not only have you um, served our community for 30 years, but you've also given back to our community in many, many ways and respects. So we thank you for that, and we thank you for also... uh, you know, being a sponsor of our show because that keeps uh, this information flowing uh, back out to our residents. And, you know, I think part of them can hear now because of your role in their life. Yeah. Well, um, you know, you and I have known each other for for that whole 30 years. So mm-hmm. uh, we go back a long way, too. So we both, you know, grew up together um, in this valley. And mm-hmm. you've done a lot of wonderful things. And people are lucky that they have a doctor around still that, that goes to people's houses and you know Barbara you've been so active in volunteering and on all these different committees and helping out our community and very well respected so I feel honored to be in your presence thank um, you thank wow. you very much yeah. we're the three musketeers <laughs> other than the three musketeers <laughs> all right so no, anyway no. um please call um advanced audiology we are located right next to the triple a building on valencia boulevard in the uh troop century 21 building where the ones with the purple sign that's um our phone number is 661-253-3277 661-253-3277 and if you call in today um you can be you can win a three-day two-night vacation and schedule your free hearing screening at the same time. Great, Noel. Appreciate you everything you've done in the community. Happy anniversary. Happy 30th yes, anniversary. Yes, absolutely. We are sponsored by Advanced Audiology and Comfort Keepers in Home Care. Listen to us next week on the Senior Hour. Now go and enhance your quality of life.